Welcome. This is session six of our study on the Gospel of John. In this session, we're going to read and discuss chapters seven, eight, and nine. Jesus attends the Festival of Booths in Jerusalem. The Jews contest his claims and attempt to arrest him. And we hear the story of Jesus and the blind man. But before all of that, we begin with a prayer. O oh God, our Father, open our eyes and enlighten our minds as we study your word. So grant that our minds may know your truth and our hearts may feel your love, and then confirm and strengthen our wills that we may go out to live what we have learned through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The pressure is building against Jesus. Not only has he been misunderstood repeatedly, but we hear more and more about those who would arrest and kill him especially if he goes back to Jerusalem. Chapter 7 would seem to follow rather well after chapter 5 when Jesus was in Jerusalem and had a run-in with the authorities about his healing on the Sabbath and then claiming to be the Son of God. We will see some repercussions of that episode here as much of chapter 7 seems to be a continuation of that same arguments we saw in chapter 5. However, he is now in Galilee, the place we left him at the end of chapter 6. So at least from the perspective of geography, we have some continuity. So we begin by reading chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He did not wish to go about in Judea, because the Jews were looking for an opportunity to kill him. Now the Jewish festival of booths was near. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one who wants to be widely known acts in secret. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify against it that its works are evil. Go to the festival yourselves. I am not going to this festival, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. So as a side note here, in John, any time we see the phrase, after this, at the start of a sentence, it means we are beginning a new episode. You can look back to see chapter 6 begin with those same words. In this case, the episode comprises the whole chapter, all of chapter 7. So we hear that Jesus wanted to stay in Galilee for a while because he didn't want to go to Judea where they wanted to kill him. Who would have thought? So we begin. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He did not wish to go about in Judea because the Jews were looking for an opportunity to kill him. After this, Jesus' brothers appear in order to give him advice, or so they think. His hour has not yet come, and he's not interested in being killed just yet. So let's go on with verse 10. But after his brothers had gone to the festival, then he also went, not publicly, but as it were, in secret. The Jews were looking for him at the festival and saying, Where is he? And there was considerable complaining about him among the crowds. While some were saying he is a good man, others were saying, no, he is deceiving the crowd. Yet no one would speak openly about him for fear of the Jews. So Jesus goes to Jerusalem, but secretly, not openly as his brothers had suggested. We are told the Jews, as distinguished from the crowds, were looking for him. We know the crowds are all Jewish, but John makes this distinction. The NRSV says the crowds were complaining about him. The Revised Standard Version uses the term muttering, not complaining. And the Common English Bible uses murmuring. Overall, in this episode, the crowds seem to be ambivalent. Some say Jesus is a good man, but others suspect he has a demon. The relative silence of those who think well of Jesus is explained by their fear of the Jews or the religious authorities. Let's go on to uh, verse 14. About the middle of the festival, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews were astonished at it, saying, How does this man have such learning when he has never been taught? 
Then Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. Those who speak on their own seek their own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is nothing unjust in him. Jesus goes up to the temple to teach, which is what one might expect of him. The Jews are astonished because Jesus knows his letters when he has never been taught. In Acts 4.13, Jesus' disciples Peter and John are described as uneducated common men. To know letters can mean simply to be literate, but it can also refer to higher learning. And from the immediate context, it is not clear which is intended. Although the Jews' astonishment implies the latter, it's doubtful that Jesus had any formal rabbinical training similar to what Paul, for example, had received. The Jews' perception seemed to be that Jesus was an insightful, literate teacher grounded in Scripture. In responding, Jesus explains that one can't make a judgment about the origin of his teaching based on some prior human standard, but based on intention to do God's will. We have already seen that knowledge of the truth of Jesus' teaching is knowledge about his origin with God. God speaks through Jesus, so he seeks not his own glory, but God's. Let's go on to verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why are you looking for the opportunity to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus answered them, I performed one work, and all of you are astonished. Because of this, Moses gave you circumcision. It is, of course, not from Moses, but from the patriarchs. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath in order that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I healed a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So suddenly Jesus raises the question of Moses and the law and charges his enemies with looking for an opportunity to kill him. In John's view, the law of Moses is valid if one understands that it testifies to Jesus. And Jesus argues that he has acted in accordance with the law. The work he refers to in verse 21 is, of course, the healing at the pool of Bethzatha which the crowd finds offensive because it happened on the Sabbath. Abraham was commanded to practice circumcision, and Mosaic law specifically commands circumcision on the eighth day, even if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath, according to the Mishnah. Jesus implies that his work was greater than circumcision. At the same time, he does not dismiss the importance of circumcision in obedience to the law. Let's go on with verses 25 through 36. Now some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Is not this the man whom they are trying to kill? And here he is speaking openly, but they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? Yet we know where this man is from. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he was teaching there in the temple, you know me, and you know where I am from. I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true, and you do not know him. I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. Then they tried to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many in the crowd believed in him, and were saying, When the Messiah comes, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will search for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will search for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. So the crowds, the people of Jerusalem, 
the temple police and the Pharisees all reacted Jesus' claims. The reactions of all except the Pharisees, who remain utterly opposed to Jesus, ranges from ambivalence to positive. The chief priests and Pharisees get serious about arresting him, and there is more confusion when Jesus mysteriously tells them a riddle about going somewhere where he cannot be found. So let's go on with uh, verses 37 through 44. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the crowd said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some asked, surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Has not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was a division in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. They wonder whether he is the Messiah, but are concerned about where he is from. We heard in chapter 1 that Jesus was the son of Joseph and was from Nazareth. The Messiah's origins would be un that the Messiah's origins would be unknown would seem to conflict with the expectation that he would come from Bethlehem. Although the obscurity of the Messiah until he is revealed does not conflict with his birth in Bethlehem. One irony in this discussion is that John, unlike Matthew and Luke, has not mentioned anything about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. The greater irony, of course, is that Jesus' origin is neither from Nazareth or Bethlehem, but from above, from God. We go on to verse 45. Then the temple police went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why did you not arrest him? The police answered, Never has anyone spoken like this. Then the Pharisees replied, Surely you have not been deceived too, have you? Has any one of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which does not know the law, they are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, asked, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? They replied, Surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search, and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. The chief priests and the Pharisees are angry that the temple police did not arrest him. They think the temple police have obviously been deluded, apparently fallen under Jesus' spell. Because they are ignorant, the crowd, unlike the authorities and the Pharisees, is accursed. The police seem to have sided with the crowd. Now Nicodemus, himself a Pharisee, reappears to suggest that according to the law, Jesus deserves a fair hearing. On the one hand, Jesus stands above the law. Yet the law fairly interpreted, even if it's not understood as pointing to Jesus, nevertheless approves him and his actions. Nicodemus here represents a balanced, fair interpretation of the law. If he does not yet understand Jesus, he is not, like his colleagues, biased against him. Nicodemus and the common people, along with all of Galilee, are now held in contempt by the authorities. Verse 53 through the first 11 verses of chapter 8, tell the story of the woman caught in committing adultery. If you remember in the climax, Jesus says, Any among you who is without sin, cast the first stone. This story is not in any of the early manuscripts of the Gospel of John and does not show up until the Middle Ages. Most scholars think it was a very, very late edition, probably the Middle Ages. Consequently, most modern translations either omit this passage entirely or include it only as a footnote. In some translations, it's included after Luke 21:38. So we begin with the 12th verse of chapter 8. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. 
Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses valid is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So this episode is loosely connected to that of chapter 7. Jesus is still teaching in the temple in the center of Jerusalem. Indeed, chapters 5 and 7 through 10 will all take place in Jerusalem in or near the temple. It begins with Jesus' announcement that he is the light of the world who offers alternative to walking in darkness. Not surprisingly, after Jesus claims to be the light of the world, the Pharisees reject him as a false witness. One cannot testify on one's own behalf. In chapter 5, we heard Jesus say he was not testifying on his own behalf because he had other, another witness. Perhaps John the baptizer. We don't know. So here he seems to concede the point, but he has also an overriding consideration. He knows his origin and destination, and they do not. A somewhat mysterious statement, but typical of the fourth gospel. Jesus says he does not judge, then immediately qualifies that statement referring to his origin and his solidarity with the Father who sent him. The Pharisees' question, where is your Father, betrays their ignorance, although perhaps their ignorance should be construed as innocent because they are, after all, ignorant. Let's go on to verse 21 through 30. Again he said to them, I am going away, and you will search for me, which you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Then the Jews said, Is he going to kill himself? Is that what he means by saying, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are from this world, I am not from this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. They said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Why do I speak to you at all? I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but the one who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. They did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak these things as the Father instructed me. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for always I always do what is pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed him. Jesus speaks now of his destiny and imminent departure, and while the Jews guess at his meaning is off base, it is not totally wrong. Jesus will indeed die. Of course, that Jesus says of them that they will die in their sin indicates the distance between him and them. The Jews in John are defined by unbelief. The price they will pay for not believing is total. In the next section, we will hear about Jews who had believed in Jesus. They almost immediately demonstrate that they are not really his disciples. They may represent fissures in the Johnian community or between it and other Christian communities, as well as divisions between Johnian Christians and the Jews. Let's go to verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will make us free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. 
I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me because there is no place in you for my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence is for you. You should do what you have heard from the Father. The discussion now centers on descent from Abraham as the tension between Jesus and his newly found Jewish believers quickly becomes apparent. Although they have believed in Jesus, they do not want to concede that their descent from Abraham now means any less to them. Since slavery is slavery to sin, freedom is apparently freedom from sin. Jesus' word of warning to them is not heeded. They are not truly his disciples and never have been. In John, fickle faith is a recurring theme, and that apparently is what we see here. We go on to verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are indeed doing what your father does. They said to him, We are not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God. And now I am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot accept my word. You are from your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is from God hears the words of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not from God. When the Jews answer that Abraham is our father, they perhaps inadvertently deny that God is their father in favor of Abraham. Jesus then asserts that their intention to kill him proves that they cannot be children of Abraham. They are not doing what Abraham did, but what their father does. He is implying that the devil is their father. Let's go to verse 48 through the end of the chapter. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it. And he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, Whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me. He of whom you say he is our God, though you do not know him, but I know him. If I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you. Before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The response of the Jews is, from their point of view, not excessive or unreasonable, for what Jesus has said is, in their view, outrageous and can be accounted for only on such terms. Jesus had not previously been accused of being a Samaritan like he is here, but he has shown an extraordinary openness to them. So we hear it again that Jesus is said to be a demon. The theological claims of the Gospel of John, particularly its Christology, are repeated many times and developed in different settings in the course of this narrative. The claims made for Jesus are at first veiled and lead to perplexity. Then they become overt and mortal hostility services. Yet even when he refers to the threat against his life, his charge is brushed off. He is accused of having a demon. He is paranoid. They pick up stones to throw at him. So Jesus leaves the temple. 
Chapter 9 gives us a little change of pace. It's the story of Jesus and a blind man. It consists of a single episode and includes a rather strange conversation. The initial hostility toward Jesus is not as sharp as it was at the end of chapter 8. So we begin with the first 12 verses of chapter 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am he. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it onto my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. The symbolism is immediate in this passage. The man is blind, that is, in the dark, so that God's works might be revealed, that is, put in the light. Night is coming. I am the light. Walking along, Jesus sees a blind man. Somehow his disciples know the man was blind from birth. The belief that illness or misfortune is the result of sin is an ancient one and dies hard. What did I do to deserve this? Jesus rejects the idea that the man's blindness is a result of sin, but his explanation is scarcely more acceptable. So that God's work might be revealed sounds suspiciously like God did this to him so that Jesus could illustrate his powers. But then Jesus subtly alludes to his coming death. Pairing these two is central to John's core message. Jesus' work displays God's glory, but that glory is finally not manifest until his death. We will see the same message again in chapter 11. The scene here is now set theologically for what Jesus will do. We hear the hint of his urgency in this passage. Jesus must be about his mission with dispatch. He spits on the ground to make mud, rubs it in the man's eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The narrative continues with an investigation of whether the man has actually been given sight. Was this man actually blind previously? How did this happen? Who did this? So we go on. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. After the man's neighbors have interrogated him, he is brought to the Pharisees, also called the Jews. They question him about being healed. Once again, we learn it is the Sabbath. 
The Pharisees now appear as judges to straighten the matter out. They call for the man's parents. Initially, even the Pharisees are divided in their opinion. Some insist on Sabbath observance as the criteria. Others find his signs very impressive, if perhaps not decisive. The former blind man continues his testimony and calls Jesus a prophet, reminiscent of the woman of Samaria at the well. The Jews attempt to disprove the miracle by showing the man who now sees is not the same as the blind man who begged. The parents, obviously cautious about what they saw, confirm that this is indeed their son who was born blind but now sees. Clearly, the parents wish to remain Jews in good standing, that is, to remain within the synagogue. The blind man miracles in the synoptics don't speak of any threats of expulsion from the synagogue. It was not a crime for one Jew to believe that another was the Messiah, even if the claim could be proved false. Still afraid, the parents make no claims about how their son came to see. The conversation in verses 18 through 23 is perhaps the single most important bit of evidence for the circumstances of the Gospel of John's origins. They were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. During the time of the historical Jesus, there is no evidence that anyone was being put out of the synagogue for believing in a Messiah. It did happen in the late 80s, a period shortly before scholars believed this gospel was written. We go on with verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him by saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and who obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins. Are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The blind man is told to admit the truth, and it is clear what truth Pharisees want to hear. Confronted with this candid judgment, the man's classic responses become proverbial. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Now they want to know how he did it. The alternative of Jesus or Moses is clearly laid down by the Jews. The Johnian Christians would agree about Moses, but not about this man, Jesus. On the contrary, they know where he comes from, that is, from God. The opponents, in saying they do not know where Jesus comes from, express their genuine ignorance. The entire scene is rich with irony. Their eyes seem to be open, but they're blind. In the final scene of this episode, Jesus finds the man who has been expelled and asks him a decisive question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? The healed man is not surprisingly somewhat mystified by the title, Son of Man. 
but he said, Lord, I believe. The Pharisees, by their light, are not blind. They see, but their light is not the light of the world. Yet, the very claim to see by someone or something other than the light of the world means that their sin is not taken away. It remains, and they remain in it. In our next session, we will read chapters 10 and 11, Jesus the Shepherd at the Gate and the Raising of Lazarus. Take care, and I'll see you at our next discussion session. <music>